webinar organized by the Crane Center for Early Childhood uh, Research and Policy at The Ohio State University. We are part of the College of Education and Human Ecology in which early childhood is one of the key pillars guiding our work. I'm Laura Justice, Executive Director of the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy, and I'm very happy to serve as our moderator today. Um, today, we are very excited to have brought together four key Ohio stakeholders who are invested in early childhood education and early learning. And they're going to be talking to us um, to answer the question of how do we rebuild Ohio's early childhood education system um, post or pre or during COVID, given all the changes we've experienced. We only have one hour together, so um, we're going to focus on our panelists addressing three questions that I will pose and then hopefully having some time at the end for um, a Q&A. Before we start, we're going to do a poll. Kathy, if you could queue up poll number one. This will help us know who is joining us here today. And so we're going to put up a poll, um, give you a few seconds to um, identify your role. So we're asking our participants, what role are you representing in your, um, in your participation today? Um, we're anticipating we have participants who are early childhood teachers, providers, maybe some researchers, some advocates, policymakers, parents, K-12 educators, or others. We'll leave this up for a few more seconds. Kathy, possible to um, put up the results of that? Okay, what role are you representing? It looks like 28% uh, are early childhood teachers, providers. The next largest category is other. Um, maybe people can type a chat and let us know who all the others are and who we, who we didn't include. A few researchers, some advocates, and. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Um, thank you for joining us. Two quick housekeeping points. Um, number one, you are welcome to submit chat, uh, questions as we move along and you can use the um, chat feature to do that. Our moderators will be examining those. And just like that last poll, we'll be doing two more of those. And so we do um, invite you to uh, participate in those polls. What I'd like to do now is ask each of our four tremendous panelists to do a brief introduction, um, where you're located and the role that you play in early childhood. And I'm gonna go in alphabetical order. So I'm gonna start with Ms. Kim Jarvis. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kim Jarvis. I am the own administrator of On Purpose Academy in Dayton, Ohio. Um, we are a preschool and an after school provider. And I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, next, I'll go to uh, State Senator Peggy Lehner. Um, hi, I'm Peggy Lehner, and I represent the 6th Senate District, which is basically the eastern half of Montgomery County. Um, I have been in the Senate now for almost 10 years. I will be term limited at the end of this year, so the clock is ticking. Um, but uh, I have, it's been an honor to serve in the Senate and in that role, I have taken a particular interest in advocacy for early childhood education. So I hate to be leaving in the midst of a major crisis, um, but um, I think I will be staying in some capacity in this field. Great, thank you for joining us. Um, and that, that breaks my heart to think of your terms running out, but maybe there's some things we can do to, I don't know, make things termless. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and I'll now turn to uh, Ms. Robin Lightcap. Thank you. I live in the Dayton area, and for the last 10 years, I've had the privilege of supporting the early childhood work across Montgomery County. And as part of Learn to Earn Dayton, which is our Cradle to Career initiative in Montgomery County, we were able to work with our locally elected officials who really made a significant investment into early childhood that allowed us to launch our tax-funded preschool promise initiative back in 2016 
So I've had the opportunity to help work with that as well. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Great. We love having you here, Robin, and following your work in Dayton. Um, and our fourth, but not last, um, participant is State Representative Allison Russo. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Laura, for having me, and thanks to everyone who has joined. I am Allison Russo. I represent Western Franklin County. I live in Upper Arlington, Ohio, so west of, of Columbus, and I am in my first term at the Ohio General Assembly, and also along with Senator Lehner, she and I co-chair the Bipartisan Legislative Children's Caucus. Um, I have an immense interest in this area of early childhood learning and care. Um, I am also happen to be the mom of three kids, my youngest of whom is almost four, who is in right now. We are, we're living in this space at the moment. Um, so not only do I have a personal interest, but also an immense policy interest uh, because I think that the long-term benefits and implications of a strong early childhood system are tremendous for our state and for our future and our kids. Great. Thank you. So you're sort of doing early childhood at every level right now. And I have to That's tell right. you, four years of age is my favorite. So you're for a fun next It book. is a fun age. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we are, thank you for those introductions and letting everybody get to know you a little bit better. Um, we're going to launch poll number two. So Kathy, I'm going to um, cue you up um, for poll number two, which actually has two parts. Um, and we'll give a few, few seconds for that. Um, and what I'm going to do as we move forward, again, I mentioned we have three questions. We'll spend about 10 to 12 minutes on each. And what I'm going to do is call out two of our panelists to be first in line to offer a response um, to each of these three questions. Um, and I am going to be so bold as to use first names, um, and, and I hope that doesn't come off as too rude. Or, um, but uh, I'll do that. And then after um, the people I call on, please, the others, uh, other two panelists, feel free to uh, chime in. Um, so our first question is, how do you align with this statement? The pandemic and its aftermath for child care providers present a once in a lifetime opportunity to build a better early child, early care and education system that serves children and families better than it has in the past. So do you see the cup half full, so to speak, that you strongly agree we've got opportunity in front of us? Or um, do you see the converse um, and how do you align with a statement? So Kathy, you want to show us our poll results? <clears throat> okay, so do we have, how much do you agree to having a once in a lifetime opportunity to build a better system for Ohio's children? How much do you agree with that? We, we still have some um, polls coming in, so I'll leave it open for just another 15 seconds or so. Okay. 15 seconds feels like a long time on a webinar. <laughs> but I am enjoying seeing people's uh, uh, chat comments about um, where not letting me submit. Um, a lot of people, folks from Head Start community, um, uh, a thank you, Senator Lehner, and a heartbreaking out there for you. Um, early childhood teacher in Southwest Ohio, early childhood mental health consultant, that work has never been as important as it is right now. Oh, neat, Education Curriculum Center Coordinator, OSU Newark, Ohio Head Start. Um, okay, so this is a very, very optimistic group. Um, sure. 80% of people agree that the time is now to think about how to make our system um, better than it was. Um, and um, sorry, the second part of this, but how optimistic are you? This will happen and uh, people are somewhat unsure how to weigh in on that. Um, and, and I have to concur with that sentiment. It's, it's hard to predict tomorrow right now. 
So question one, and I'm going to ask uh, Robin and then Allison to, to uh, offer your comments first, and then obviously we'd like uh, Kim and Peggy to join in as well. The pandemic has forced closures, some temporary, some permanent, of many child care centers and home-based providers across the state and has placed a renewed emphasis on health and safety. The economy also has been hit hard with record number of Ohioans relying on unemployment and food assistance. All of this is to say we're at a truly unique and challenging moment in time. From your perspectives, what problems in Ohio's current early education and child care system do we now have a chance or obligation to fix or improve? From where you sit, what big issues should we be thinking about? What opportunity is there now where we are? Um, and I'll, Robin, I'd like you first to comment. Okay, great. Thank you. That's obviously a great question to ask ourselves. And I think for me, the, the overarching big statement is to think about early child care in education as truly part of the education system. We, we've made progress in that direction, but I still think we bifurcate the systems and we think of it, this as childcare or daycare, babysitting, and all of our policies are still focused on parents and whether parents qualify is not about the child and the child's education. So I think we have an opportunity to, and I think this pandemic has forced us to wrestle with what is childcare? Is childcare education? Because we're not handled in the K-12 uh, rules and regulations that come down from the governor, but then there's all this confusion about it because it is similar to K-12, the issues that we face, but it's needed for the workforce support. And so we do play a dual role in early childhood of both supporting the workforce and educating, but I think we have an opportunity to elevate the importance of and the understanding that this really is education that starts at birth and that it's not just like you alluded to, Laura, it's early childhood mental health, it's the home visiting, it's the healthcare site, all of that is part of the education system when we're talking about our babies, our infants and toddlers and our preschoolers. So that's the overarching thing. And of course, with that comes consistency and equity and funding and how we think about paying the people who work in the front line in this field. That has to be top of our minds as we think about building back a better system is more equitable pay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Russo? Yeah, so I would add to what Robin said, and I completely agree with her. I would say that, you know, I think this has also forced us to view our child care, early um, childhood system as a key part of our economic infrastructure. And I think we have to remember that, you know, we, this is, when we're talking about our providers, the, this is the workforce behind the workforce. Um, parents cannot return to jobs um, without reliable access to good quality early childhood education and care. It's such a, a, a necessary investment when we think about costs that we avoid later on, um, certainly from a state perspective in terms of intervention services. Uh, we know that children perform better in the long term. Um, so this needs to be viewed, uh, again, as a key part of our economic infrastructure, but also that we have to value public investment in this infrastructure. And what I hope is an opportunity here is, again, understanding that this is a system that needs more public investment. And uh, I hope that we're having more of that conversation moving forward, even in this you know, tough economic time and, and where we're facing budget shortfalls and will be facing in the upcoming years, we have to recognize that this is such a necessary, critical investment. Kim and Peggy, you want to weigh in on what you think are the big, what are the opportunities that we, we have here? Well, you know, this situation kind of reminds me of the whole um, New Orleans and Katrina, and they basically wiped out their school system and were able to start from scratch. Um, and there's still, the jury is still out on whether or not New Orleans has come out much better than they went into it. Um, some people think they did. Um, but there is a difference that I see between New Orleans and what we have going on right now. 
um, that I'm just a little not sure how we're going to deal with. And that's the fact that this crisis is ongoing, whereas in New Orleans there was an event and it ended. This one is continuing to carry on. So it's kind of like trying to fix a storm roof blown away by a tornado while another tornado is coming down upon you. It's, it's very difficult to do. So I don't think we should downplay. Uh, I'd like to be really Pollyanna about this and say we've got a great chance here to rebuild, but I think the recognition that this is going to be in front of us for some time is sort of a sobering thought. And I absolutely agree with all the comments that were made. Um, my concern is the same, the capacity, the access to childcare. As a provider, it's very interesting how we have employees going back to work and centers that are reopening, but we're limited in how many children that we can take. So it's a, it's a contradiction. And so daycare centers, are, our childcare providers are struggling trying to meet the need and still not have the capacity. So I think the conversation is really good that we're having now to make sure that everybody's on the same page that we're communicating correctly because you cannot have people working and not have quality child care that access that representative russo was talking about and then to get everybody back to work which is what robin alluded to the financial capacity to pay them i think it's interesting that a lot of child care providers have chosen not to go back to work to make the choice and use unemployment because of the bonus mm -hmm. and you probably won't see a lot of that in the k through 12 system because they have you know, they have benefits, they have 401ks, they have all types of things that they rely on. In childcare, in the childcare industry, we don't have that because we don't have the financial capacity to pay them. And so our turnover is high and we have to constantly train new employees to meet the need. And so that affects quality of care. So I guess what I'm saying is the capacity, the, the ratio to serve families and then the financial wherewithal to become all that we need to be so that we can be the quality care that the state needs and we have to do both in conjunction with with everything at the same time and it is not an easy fix like mrs lana was saying Kim, are those your kids background they are and i really try very hard to find a hiding place and it is not <laughs> you didn't do it <laughs> they're doing all kinds of things around the center. So excuse my background noise. I'm oh, like, no. no. <laughs> now we, we like those sounds. And uh, when did, did you um, stay open as a pandemic site or did you just recently reopen? We stayed open as a pandemic site. So on June 1st, we just reannounced that we're on Purpose Academy again. I just kind of made it a fun thing. Like we're no longer pandemic center. We're, we're back to on Purpose Academy. And my staff has been tremendous. They've stayed the course, they've been positive. And they just tried to, you know, make lemonade out of lemons. So we're doing. Oh, thank you. It's our pleasure. Let me. Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. We have policymakers and um, practitioners, administrators, all here, and you know, there's very clear themes in what we need to be doing. Um, whatever your perspective is. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to shift to question two, and I'm going to pose this one to Kim and, Kim and Robin, specifically because of your roles um, as administrators and sort of on the ground leaders around early childhood programming in, in our communities. Um, racial equity, racial justice is at the forefront of everybody's mind right now um, because of certain obvious recent events. Um, and this is something that should have been at the forefront of our thinking in early education, you know, perpetually into our history. But now um, we're at, a, at a, a juncture, I think, where we see a lot of action and potential um, around us. So, so we are at a historical moment. We're poised for change. And, and I want to ask each of you to share your perspectives on what do we need to be thinking about doing differently doing better when we serve black children and families in particular. Um, and given that um, many of our early childhood providers are white women, um, what, what should um, white teachers be doing differently or thinking about as we sit at this crossroads and we hope for very positive changes in our future? And, and I'd love to hear each of your perspectives. 
Kim, yeah, there you go. Okay, you wanna go first, Robin, or me? Either way, you can go first. Okay, all right, well, I think that is a great question, Lauren. It is something that we definitely have to address. You know, I think most people are good and most people want to see change and most people want to see a difference because of everything we're dealing with. But I think it really starts with us taking an introspective look and what I call our own cultural competency, looking at our own life, looking at our own network. How many people of a diversity do we engage with? How many people of diversity do we network with, share with, talk with, have dinner with? Because if we can't implement in our own lives, how can we implement it in our organizations and our institutions of education. It starts with us as leaders. And so I think it's looking at that and cultural competency is just understanding other cultures. What, what are they about? How do they respond? What are their beliefs? And being comfortable with that and being, a, being comfortable with integrating that into your center. And we have to be honest, sometimes it's difficult. You don't know, you don't understand. Some things don't make sense. Some people still don't understand that black lives matter. They don't get it. That's not an indictment. It means you just don't understand. And so I think it's part of us educating ourselves culturally and being culturally competent is a first start for me. And then I think secondly would be just intentional about making a change, like being intentional about hiring people of color, being intentional about training people of color because they have not had the same access as white teachers, as you mentioned, Laura. And so we have to put in the time and the work. And that goes back to dollars because you need money for professional development. But you have to be intentional. It's not easy to be to bring in something new to your center because then you're faced with will we lose parents? Will we lose staff? Will we lose children? Will we lose our image in the community because now we're more diverse? And so I think it really it com comes down to intentionality and then that support, integrating the, the new staff and the new policies and the new culture so that everybody understands because it's going to take a, co a collaborative effort to make this change. And so I guess what I'm saying is introspective, what's your cultural competence, being intentional, and then the support and integration to make it last. So there's not a one-stop thing or that's something that you just check to make sure that it's done. I think we have to be, take a comprehensive approach to this, but I do think it's possible. You know, 1954, they had the segregation. We don't want to be segregated in early childhood. We want to be integrated. And that's what I think this is an opportunity to do. So certainly I agree with the things Kim shared. Um, what I would say is as a white woman who grew up in a predominantly white community and a white woman who still lives in a predominantly white uh, community, I certainly don't think I have this all figured out myself. I've been on a learning journey, especially the, the last uh, seven years, I would say. And I think that one thing I feel really convicted about is that until those of us who live in predominantly white communities and send our kids to predominantly white schools step up and own this, we are never going to solve the problem. We, we far too often say, oh, we don't have a racial equity problem. We don't have very many black kids or we don't have any black kids in our program. And that's a problem. And I think it starts with early childhood education. Uh, we still live in a largely segregated world. We still have programs that are largely segregated by income and because of the structural racism that is aligned closely with race. And so we still have to work on that more integrated approach that Kim was alluding to. I think one of the sad realities is that in early childhood, we actually have more childcare teachers who are African-American than we do in the K-12 system. And you look at the pay, <laughs> And it's just another example of the inequities that we have. We have more black teachers making really abysmally low wages and that has to get fixed. We need to honor and respect the black women, largely women, some black men that we have in the field and pay them appropriately, so provide support. But then I think those of us who are in positions like we are at either a higher ed institution, leading community efforts in the legislature, we have to ask ourselves, how are we making sure we have African-American men and women helping us make those policy decisions? Because I think we're still weak in that area. When I think about our professors who are educating, whether it's a CDA and associates, a bachelor's, a master's, we need more diversity there. Obviously, I'm not an early childhood development expert. There are certainly things that we can be doing in the classroom with our children and with families. And I'll leave that to those of you who are experts on that, but I think we need to be more assertive about doing that in all of our programs. 
And the final thing I would say is I think there's an opportunity to look at policies that will help drive this, things even as simple as step up quality. Um, we don't have anything that talks about race that I'm aware of in the, in the guideline. And that should be, that should be part of the system. There are ways we can start to put support in that is, you know, much needed in my opinion. Thank you for those very thoughtful um, comments. Um, and I'm wondering if our uh, po policymakers would sure. like to comment as well. Yeah, Allison, you wanna go ahead? I've got something yeah. to say, but you go first. Sure, I would say, you know, I, I think about this through too, in addition to as a policymaker, I think through the lens of a, a parent uh, who has a child who is currently in preschool and uh, who often also happens to benefit from having many early childhood teachers and providers in my life who I've been having this conversation with. And, you know, I think this also, in addition to everything that's been said, you know, really thinking too about uh, the curriculum, everything from the, the stories and the books that we read in the classroom to the music, uh, that we teach in the classroom, uh, really thinking about how do we show and diversify um, different uh, voices and experiences and, and, you know, showing children very early on and exposing them to diversity, uh, because I think that we do have to be very intentional about this. And I think also, uh, I noticed in the comments, someone mentioned the Kerwin Institute, and, and I think also making sure that you know, as providers and those who are in the space, checking our own implicit bias. And, and I think that that is very important as well. Um, so, you know, I, I would answer that question, I, I think through a, a parent's lens also. You know, our first question that we had here today was how do we take, see the COVID crisis as an opportunity to restructure and rebuild our children's um, early childhood care programs. Um, I'm a bit challenged to see how we can do it with COVID, but this crisis, which is every bit as gripping our nation, frankly, as COVID, but the whole um, movement triggered by George Floyd's death, I think is a tremendous opportunity to have very open and honest discussions about how early childhood is impacted by lack of equity. And it's huge, it's all over the place. So unlike COVID, here I think we really do have an opportunity um, to approach things in a very different way than we have in the past. Thank you for that. These are, I really, really think everyone listening to this um, appreciates your, your collective comments. Um, I, before I move on, I'm gonna, we're gonna put up poll three. So Kathy, I'm gonna cue you for poll three. Um, and while we're um, answering poll three, I will just comment that my good friends, um, Stephanie Curington and Ioma Iruka, just published um, this book last month. It's called, and I'm not getting paid for this. This is not a product placement. Mm -hmm. Don't Look Away, Embracing Anti-Bias Classrooms. And um, we're actually gonna engage with them um, at the Schoenbaum Family Center at Ohio State University. We've reopened this week and we're working with the authors to um, think about how to use this guide um, in the work we do moving forward. Um, and if anyone participating is interested in that topic, we're involving our early Head Start providers in our school to begin to have serious conversations about how to be anti-bias settings. And I think uh, Representative Russo, this goes to your point that um, how to really carefully look at our curriculum um, and sort of certain static things that we do that just are not just. Um, so we're taking this opportunity. Um, <laughs> good questions on this uh, topic. And just because we're waiting on the poll, um, you know, the issue of funding in early childhood, as, as Robin mentioned, does end up tracking children um, racially um, into classrooms and programs at this very young age. And so perhaps there's avenues as we begin to rethink funding around early childhood, maybe we can use a, a racial justice lens to 
think about how to use funding to really just blow this up the way we um, track kids by funding streams early on. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Blow, it, blow it up was figurative, by the way. Well, just really fast. I always think about that because you think about like Head Start and Head Start has these requirements that you have to have everybody under 100% of the federal poverty level. Well, that policy segregates our kids. <laughs> it doesn't, you know, you can have up to 10% over, but that very policy prevents what we all know is best for everybody. And so I think I just am underscoring what you're saying. There are very practical things we could change in how we fund our systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unintended consequences, I'm sure. So from your perspective, what issues most need to be addressed when rebuilding Ohio's early care and education system? Let's look at the number one, 77, here we go. 77% is funding. Um, you know, yeah. funding is gonna drive all sorts of positive changes if we can increase it. So um, child care quality, about two thirds of folks, equity and diversity, teacher training. So those are our um, big, themes here. What's interesting is um, affordability and cost. I mean, still half of people voted for that, but I would say going into COVID, at least in the popular media, affordability and cost was a really driving theme. Um, but now um, we're thinking about increasing funding as our number one priority. So thank you um, everybody for contributing. I will um, shift to question three and I'm going to ask um, our uh, representative and senator to first bring to bear your lens on this uh, question. For as unfortunate as this pandemic has been, it's forced many more people to realize how critical it is for families to have quality, reliable care for their young children. COVID has really hammered at home and more people are asking, how can we expect parents to work without care for the kids? And I think, you know, with certain decisions going on in big school districts, this is really timely to answer this question. How can we expect parents to work without care for their kids? How can we expect teachers to put their health on the line and not be adequately compensated for this work? Um, so as we sit in this unique historical moment and reflect, what if we failed what have we failed to do in the past to get us towards a greater investment in the EC system as we sit at this sort of precipice of events? What haven't we done that we should have done in the past? Um, so I, I will start with that. I, you know, I think it goes back to my original comments and that is looking at this as a key piece of our economic infrastructure and that we have to put more public investment. Uh, we know, uh, just uh, let's start with publicly funded childcare and where we are in the eligibility for that in the state of Ohio, we have some of the lowest eligibility rates in the country in Ohio. We need to increase that uh, at a minimum. I would like to see it closer to 200% of federal poverty level. Um, that is absolutely, I think, where we have to start is, is putting more investment, especially in publicly funded childcare. But that's not enough. I mean, frankly, you know, we were in a critical situation with early childhood learning and care before COVID-19. COVID-19 has taking, taken it from critical to dire. And, you know, we already know that we are at tremendous risk of losing permanently about 45% of our capacity permanently. And, and that's, uh, you know, in addition to what we've already lost uh, due to the lower ratios. And so we really have to think about, in addition to publicly funded childcare, how can we sustain this infrastructure? And, you know, to me, whether that is through, uh, you know, using tax credits or, uh, loan and grant, additional loan and grant programs from the federal and state government. Uh, we need to be very creative in how we think about this because we absolutely have to have more investment in this um, resource. Yeah, I, I agree with Allison on that, but you know, something I've noticed in the years that I've been working on early childhood education thing, it's such a female dominated concern if you look at the Early Childhood Advisory Council, for example, I think there's 40 members. I think there are two men involved in it. Um, the majority of people in the Senate and in the House of Representatives are men. 
And so when we're advocating for additional funding and we're going after a target audience that's maybe less than totally engaged in it, we need to reframe how, what we're asking for. And I think if we can figure out how to play up the fact that if we don't have high quality early childhood education, we don't have a workforce. Um, we know that when we're underfunding early childhood, women in the workforce are particularly harmed. And there's a huge percentage, a much greater percentage of women who will leave the workforce than men because of lack of childcare. So I think we need to give some serious discussion about how we reframe this, not as what many men see as preschool and far too many of them perhaps look on preschool as something that they can do to keep their wife sane during the day because the kids are off at preschool. We need to change that conversation and talk about how do we fund early childhood, early childhood care so that our workforce can be as robust and productive as possible. So there's an opportunity there, I think. You know, just to follow up, because I completely agree with Senator Lehner, I, we do have to change how we frame some of this discussion, I think, to get more of our policymakers on board. Um, but I will say one of the opportunities that I think has opened up coming, you know, through this, this COVID situation is the number of conversations that I have had with many of our business leaders in uh, our community and around the state, because I will tell you that businesses and company executives Get it. know that this is a top concern of their working parents. And I think we've got many uh, business leaders around the state who are now at the table talking about this and understanding that they cannot move forward uh, with keeping their businesses open and getting back to full productivity if childcare um, continues to suffer in the way and if we lose capacity in uh, early childhood care and learning. So I think that, again, that's another opportunity that I think comes out on the other side of this is having more engagement uh, from that community as well and speaking up on this issue. Yeah. And turn those business folks into real advocates. You know, they're, frankly, I'm going to be crass about it. That's who funds campaigns. And, um, you know, that, that talks to uh, my colleagues. We do welcome you to be crass. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> that, um, that's being restrained. <laughs> Um, Kim and Robin, would you like to comment on this from your perspective of what have we failed um, to do in the past to get us towards more investment in the system? And I'm sure you have really unique perspectives on this. Robin? <laughs> okay. So, yeah, everything that everyone said, of course, I agree with. And I think that if we don't make the change, talking about the framework, let me go back to that, what Allison said about the framework. All the money that's been invested in early child care, zero to three, preschool promise. If we don't make the change now, we won't see the benefits when they get into school. It just won't be. There'll be money invested, but you won't see the, the outcome, the, the end product. We're not, we won't see it because it hasn't been invested in the teachers and in the education to get what we're looking for. So we could appease ourselves with the money and things like that, but the children won't have that as, as they're progressing through K through 12 schools. So I think it's important for us to do that. Um, you know, with the capacity and having access, we have to make the change. I share with Robin a, a scenario that I thought would help, even with going back to, to work and to schools. You know, right now our ratio is nine to one in the state of Ohio, correct? In our guidelines, every child has to have 35 square feet to be safe. This is pre-COVID. So one of the things we possibly could do to open up some space, some capacity, if we gave every child 36 square feet, right? That's six times six square feet of access. So that would open up capacity a little bit for, for centers to have a little bit of wiggle room as we're making these policy changes. Because while we're talking about it now, it still doesn't help when August 19th comes around and we don't have a place for our students to go. And it doesn't help when bus, when kids need to get off the bus and go somewhere because they can't go home because their parents are not there. So I think what I'm saying is, what can we do now in the short term and not fail to do that so that as we're making these policy changes, we'll be in the right position to, to have those implemented. 
So I would like to see something change with the ratio as we're making these policy changes with funding for um, professional development and staff and training and things like that. Robin, would you like to wait? Yeah, I mean, I think to your question about what have we failed to do in the past, it's we have we failed to convince people that it's worth the significant financial investment. I mean, the problem is it's super expensive and we have to be willing to take money away from something else or increase revenue. And I totally agree that it's our businesses. We have to engage our businesses, which are still largely led by men. And so it's that dual thing of business, men, the other group that I don't think we have engaged and mobilized in mass that we need to as parents. Um, obviously, kids can't advocate for themselves, but parents could have a strong voice and parents are the ones voting for the legislature, folks who make these decisions. So I think there's an opportunity around parent voice as well. And those two categories of businesses, parents coming together could actually be enough of a groundswell to to make a difference on our policies going forward, I think. Let me ask a follow-up question. I'm gonna ask um, each of you to provide one all-in, hardcore, concrete response to this question. And it, it follows on the comments we all that you all just made. If we could do one thing in the future to convince leaders we need to treat early care and education like a bigger priority, which would hopefully lead to more funding. Like, what, what is the one strategy you've thought about or seen work that you think we should be thinking about? So I have this like, like this is probably not what you're asking for, but since you said we can just like be real. <laughs> I My thought is we should have a day where we like have childcare walkout and the whole state there's no childcare and I seriously sometimes I think that would make this huge impact because all of a sudden people would go wow this is a really big deal and you know there's a part of me that thinks the pandemic helped with that yes. but the realistic part of me thinks once we get back into the day-to-day -day, it'll be out of sight out of mind like it's a crisis at the moment because they're concerned about their PPP loans and they're concerned about paying staff and getting people back but I'm concerned it won't be a long lasting concern. It's just an immediate, we have a work crisis, but in day-to-day -day norm normality, it's not top of mind. So I don't know, that does a negative way. I'll think about a more positive way when nobody <laughs> else shares. Can I just say ditto to Robin's idea? I think that's a great one. Mm -hmm. I uh, I'd like to hear what Kim has to say about a childcare walkout. So I think it's a great idea and I think it's actually positive. If we can't do a walkout, I say bring all the policy decision makers into a preschool and have them mandated to spend eight hours a day in a classroom with curriculum development, teaching, instruction, nap time, lunch time, outside time, and let them understand what it is involved in taking a classroom from, from in the morning to the afternoon, maybe even a week. Let's do a week being in the classroom. That's what I would say. And then they would see it from another perspective. The walkout happened before the kids come, not a, <laughs> this vision of like little kids roaming all over. Well, I think, you know, and, and I, I agree, you know, this, that's a very powerful statement, but you know, I would say that, you know, essentially when we had our child care centers closing across Ohio, for the vast majority of working parents, that is essentially what has happened. And I think that is, you know, I mentioned before the, the numerous conversations that I have had with business leaders across the state, they fully suddenly recognized, hey, my working parents who are now taking care of their kids at home while also trying to work and be productive and we've got kids home from school, um, this is a little glimpse, frankly, that that many, unfortunately, many people in our community who are at highest risk face every single day, even before COVID. Now, suddenly, a vast majority of the state and working parents were facing in terms of limited access to child care, um, limited ability to fully you know, participate in the workforce and be productive during the workday. Um, but, you know, when you think about, you know, one revolutionary action, you know, again, I go back to, we have to look at this as a critical public investment and just, you know, 
getting I think policymakers and decision makers at the table. And I absolutely agree with Senator Lehner. When you look at who we are represented by, not only at the state house but also at the congressional level, very few people are in this stage of life where you are living this every single day and you're very close to what the realities are in terms of getting access to quality early childhood education, paying for it regardless of whether or not you're um, getting assistance or not. It's, it's expensive across the board. Um, and the realities of some of the, the limitations that you often face in terms of hours and the flexibility, uh, especially if you're in a job that doesn't have a traditional eight to five um, hour. Um, and having more people who are at the table making these decisions and setting policies who come with some very recent experience and perspective, I think is, is very helpful, you know, whether that uh, are female lawmakers or are male lawmakers. I, I think the value of having uh, even parents with young children is also important. Mm -hmm. You know, one challenge um, I was thinking of as Allison was talking there is you could stage a walk in, a walk out, but you'd have to somehow engage the private providers as well. Um, because, you know, once again, we're talking privilege and power and the people who are paying a lot of money for their kids daycare that suddenly have that taken away. That means something to them a lot more than uh, you know, something that's only involving those people who are publicly funded. Um, I think from an advocacy point of view, you need to reach all legislators and all power brokers out there and, and uh, not just a few. Uh, just, uh, um, just since we have um, a member of our House of Representatives and our Senate here, and you're both um, parts of the Children's Caucus, and we applaud you for that investment. I'm just curious if you're willing to share um, what it's like being a legislator and championing these issues in, you know, our, where, where is it? You're not City Hall, the Capitol. Um, when you're down there and you bring up these issues generally to um, legislators, how, are, how is it received? Are people like, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. What can we do? Or are they more like, this is not important? What, what do you hear when you bring this up? I'd say, yeah, they say, yeah, yeah, what can we do? And then they don't do anything. Um, it's sort of a cross between the two. I've seen a remarkably increased um, interest in early, in early childhood education since we first started. Frankly, I think it's, it's kind of a dicey issue. People like it and we've had governors, the last two governors, both have been willing to put substantially more money into it and they continue to do that. And I don't see in our caucus, at least I don't hear, hear members saying, oh, gee, they put 30 million towards early childhood, what a waste, or anything like that. They seem supportive of it. Um, what the problem is, is that we need far more than 30 million. Um, so it's a matter of increasing that amount. And so we still have work to do in convincing folks that this has to be a very, very high priority and not just something that's you know, nice that we support early childhood through. Yeah. Tell me. I would, I would agree with that. I think uh, part of the challenge and, and where we continually have to educate and have these conversations is making sure that our colleagues know this is not just a women's issue. Um, you know, to me, this, this is much broader than that. And, and, and I think that that is getting through. I, I really do. I think we've made some progress in, in that space. Um, but also, you know, part of the challenge that we have, particularly in a state legislature in Ohio, we work in two year budget cycles. And we're often working with people who are there in two-year terms or four-year terms. And so getting people to understand, you know, investment in early childhood, the payoff that you see is many fold in terms of the economic payoff, uh, but it's also 10 and 20 years down the road often, at least from a budgetary perspective and where you're going to get that payoff and that savings. And so getting people often on issues like this, especially legislators, to think beyond just the two years in front of us or the four years in front of us and thinking beyond in 10 and 20 year investments 
is a huge challenge. Uh, I feel, I think fortunately we have a governor who recognizes that right now, which is why uh, Senator Lehner and I reinstituted the Children's Caucus because we thought there was a tremendous opportunity there with the current governor who I think is, is um, willing to look 10 and 20 years and, and the importance of that investment for the state of Ohio. Um, but getting sometimes our legislators to kind of put the, their money where their mouth is and what they're thinking about this and understand that, you know, we'll put a bunch of money in for this budget cycle, but we may not get real economic payoffs in terms of, you know, the less intervention in the school setting, uh, less intervention in terms of our criminal justice system, uh, you know, um, we have to get them there and people to be thinking more long term. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much for those um, comments. Um, we have just a few more minutes together and I'm going to throw out some questions that um, are coming in from our participants. Um, and I'm going to pose the first one to Kim. Um, you are running a school for early learning. You're, you must be making paychecks and balancing your budget and thinking really brass tacks about the issue of how do we better compensate our early educators given the current funding uh, situation. Um, and so I'm going to ask you, from your perspective, what do you see as the barriers to increasing compensation for our early educators? So in, in a community-based center like myself or private centers, we have to do the same we have the same requirements as let's say a, P, a K through 12 school. So I have to still meet my step up to quality guidelines. I still have to meet my safety guidelines. I still have to do all those things with the budget of publicly funded childcare. So how do, it's difficult for me to hire someone straight out of college because I can't attract them with the salary that I'm able to, to provide. Even if it's at the top of a pay scale within our industry, it's still not enough to, uh, to get them to not choose a, a public school or a private school. And so that is preventing us from getting degreed teachers many times. And so we have to hire, not have to as if it's a deficit, but we're, we're hiring um, individuals that may want to learn the craft or the industry, but they don't have the education behind it. So that puts us behind a little bit when we're trying to advance you know, the education of kids. And so um, I think having additional funding would help us to attract uh, more qualified staff at the onset. I would love to be able to go to Ohio State or other colleges and participate in their career fairs, just like any other uh, employer. But I would not be able to stand a chance with other schools that are paying high, not just higher salaries, base pays, but benefits, as I mentioned, 401ks, pensions, paid leave, maternity leave, all those things. And that's why you see so much turnover in early child care within our industry because there's not enough to attract people to stay. And so we're constantly starting over and over and over again. And so that would eliminate a lot of the um, learning curve. And so we could advance further if we can either train or hire um, higher quality staff at the beginning or send them back to school because we have the money to cover tuition assistance. That's the other thing. There are people that maybe didn't get a chance to start out in college, but they have a passion for it. How do I send them to school and pay for it? Because they made a commitment to stay with my center. So even the tuition assistance would be a great incentive to have. Robin, do you want to comment on that? I know you, um, in the Dayton area, you work with a lot of different early educators who are affiliated with the public schools, uh, nonprofits, for-profits. How do you deal with sort of the discontinuities and wage structures across these different sectors? You know, I, I guess I can comment on it by just acknowledging, yes, it's a huge problem. We certainly don't have it figured out. We have a new position who is working with us on creating the promise pathway. Obviously, I saw, I saw some of the comments alluding to the power of the profession. Certainly, NACI is looking this up. I always feel like it's a chicken and egg conversation because we need to pay more in order to attract and retain the folks that have four-year degrees plus, but we need people that have four-year degrees plus to justify the paying more, and it's, it just feels like we don't ever get out of it. So 
what, what we're trying to work on is a stronger pathway system that shows folks like if you're in high school, you get a CDA, this is how we're going to help you get the associates, this is how we are going to help you get a bachelor's, this is how it can progress to a higher paying wage. And it, it saddens me that we can't just try to keep people in the childcare centers forever, but I can't in good conscience keep them at the kind of pay when it's an average pay of $11, $12 an hour, that's just not right. So we've got to figure out how to increase that while also helping people along the pathway. That's the best solution. But I'm sure some of the panel or the participants in this might have other ideas because we certainly don't have it figured out. It's a real dilemma. So I think uh, Marie Ward commented on um, something here is echoing with her that free tuition or tuition waivers for student loans for individuals um, could go a long way. And um, I remember back after I got my doctorate, um, a lot of people in my field, speech and hearing, did not do clinical research. And so there were a lot of sort of stimulus dollars that came out around student loan forgiveness to get people to do a kind of clinical research that many people weren't doing. So I love, love, love that idea. Um, it is 1157 um, and sadly our time is coming to an end together. Um, I, I'm really grateful personally to get to spend even this sort of Zoom-like uh, time with each other. Uh, Kim Jarvis, owner and director of On Purpose Academy and Mentoring Center, we'd love to visit you and see what you're doing there. Uh, well, Senator Peggy Lehner, uh, one of our greatest champions for children in our state, we're going to miss you. Robin Lightcap, Executive Director, Learned to Earn Dayton, um, and State Representative Allison Russo. You'll have to be the big torchbearer now for the children. I have big shoes to fill. <laughs> yes, but we're, we're here with you, so call on us. Um, I know we have a lot to do um, in the work that we do, and it's because of leadership like um, Peggy, Allison, Kim, and Robin provide across our state that we can lift this agenda, we can make noise, we can push for a difference. Um, so I'm going to be as optimistic as I can that in the future we'll look back to now and we'll have seized an opportunity and made things better than they were. We just have to believe that's the journey on that we're on. So thank you for joining us today, our panelists and all of our participants. Um, Stay tuned for future events and um, we will send you a brief survey um, and stay in touch with us as um, the summer goes by. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your afternoon. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thanks for all the great work that Crane Center does. It's really awesome. Uh, take care everybody.